Well, it's really um, a real privilege and an honour to be here, and I'm incredibly grateful that so many of you have come this evening to listen to me, and I hope to also to have a discussion with you, because I'm certainly not going to speak for 45 minutes or an hour non-stop. I will speak, I hope, for a fairly brief amount of time, perhaps 30 or 40 minutes, and then I really want to hear from you, because I think you have uh, the ideas that we as an international community really need. I think this is an exciting time to be speaking about this topic, resolving Europe's refugee crisis. Because as you're going to see, I think this crisis is only just the beginning. If you think last year was problematic, you ain't seen nothing yet. I think we've got much more in terms of numbers and challenges coming this year and in future years. So we're really having this discussion at the beginning of the crisis, and by no means I think we're the crisis. So it's a really good time to be having the discussion. I think this is also a great place to be having this discussion. I have many years working in universities. I don't work in the university full-time at the moment. I come to Maastricht now and again to do some teaching. But I think universities are where this discussion should be taking place. And let me just quickly say why I think that is. The reason is because I think the debate around refugees in Europe and the debate around migration more generally is at risk of becoming increasingly polarised. You either find yourself this end of the spectrum, and you think that all refugees are heroes and victims and we need to welcome them, and we need to save them, and we need to assist them, or you find yourself at this end of the spectrum and you think they're all potential terrorists and they're coming to take our jobs and they're coming to take our housing and to clog up our healthcare and so on and so forth. And of course the truth is somewhere in between those two poles. And I think it behoves us as an academic community here in an academic setting to make sure that we have an objective, sensible, informed, evidence-based so this is the right place to be having this discussion. The right time, the right place, and also you are the right people. Because I really mean this, and you'll see as I make my presentation, I think the people that you and I normally rely on to resolve the refugee crisis have simply run out of ideas. I think the European Union is stuck. They have summits every six weeks. They can't decide even on basics like how to distribute refugees across uh, the European Union. Countries from Sweden to Hungary to the United Kingdom are retreating into an inward-looking, insular approach. They're retreating away from any form of harmonization or compassion towards uh, these issues. UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, is struggling to keep up. The International Organization for Migration is providing services but struggling to do anything strategic. We are running out of ideas. One of the ideas I'm going to suggest is that the private sector, businesses, may have something to contribute. But I think more than anything else, people like you, as concerned, interested, innovative, young citizens who have the most to offer. So I genuinely think that you should be thinking and speaking out and making your contribution to try to resolve this crisis. So, the right time, the right place, and I think also the right people. Thank you for being here. A quick overview of what I'd like to do, and again, I hope not to speak for ages and ages, and I really want to hear from you, and hopefully I'll provoke you, and hopefully you'll disagree with something that I say, I'm here to be challenged, not just to convey uh, information. I want to start with a quick overview of Europe's so-called refugee crisis. And you'll notice on the opening slide I put crisis in inverted commas, and I think we should maintain those inverted commas. Because I don't think <coughs> Europe is undergoing a refugee crisis. Our politicians do, our media does, I think lots of policymakers do, and lots of people in the general public do as well. I think we need to disabuse them of that idea, we need to explain the numbers, lend some perspective to this issue, and explain that this isn't a crisis, it doesn't have to be a crisis. But I'll start by providing an overview of numbers, of where we're going, of why, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, I think this is just the beginning and nowhere near the end at the moment. And I don't want to underestimate this. There are challenges. There are people drowning. There are large numbers of people coming to Europe. But let's try to get some perspective and not overreact. For the second part of the presentation, I want to do what I think lots of policymakers are trying to do. If you think the numbers are the problem, and I don't think, I do think the numbers are the problem, but if you think the numbers are the problem, what can we do to reduce the numbers? What can be done, uh, either reactively or proactively, either by individual states or by the European Union as a whole, to try to reduce the flows of refugees? There has to be something that we can do. We can't just sit, uh, uh, sit here and watch more and more people arrive by boat and drown and so on and so forth. Is there something we can do to try to reduce the numbers? That's the second part of what I'd like to say, and I think, I hope that would be quite provocative. The third part, and 
the really meaningful, I hope, part of my presentation is to argue that it's not the numbers that matter. If you focus your attention on trying to reduce the numbers, you are trying to solve the wrong crisis. There is another crisis entirely in the European Union. It's a crisis of confidence, it's a crisis of political leadership, it's a crisis of compassion. And I want to argue that there's a different way to approach this crisis and a different way to try to resolve it. So the last part of the presentation will be about trying to understand and resolve what I think is the real crisis that we're facing at the moment in the European Union. So three, I hope, quite clear sections for what I'm going to do. Let's start with an overview, and again, let us not underestimate the challenges that exist and are ahead. And these are just some bullet points, and let me talk through them fairly swiftly. We know that in 2015, last year, at least 1 million refugees arrived in the European Union, actually slightly more than that, 1.2 million or so, at least a million by boat alone, and others using the, over, the overland route from South and Eastern uh, Europe. That was four times the number who arrived in 2014. So 2015 already was an historically high year and a year that set alarm bells ringing. Four times the number of people who'd arrived the previous year arrived in the European Union last year. It's a big number of people and it's a very significant increase indeed. Look at the numbers this year. We are, what, 45, 55 days into this year, 31 plus 24, 55 I think it is, days into the year so far, 24th of February. Today, or at least last night, when the IOM published these figures, today, 110,000 people have arrived in the European Union this year. That compares to 16,000 over the same period in 2015. Almost 10 times the number of people who arrived this time last year have already arrived this time this year. If you think 2015 was a record year, as I say, I don't think you've seen anything yet. Ten times the number of people who arrived in the first 50 days or so in 2015 have already arrived in 2016. The numbers are going up, they're by no means going down. The third point really applies more in places like the Andaman Sea and in the seas around Australia, and you know that these parts of the world are also having big debates about asylum seekers and refugee flows and irregular migrants and boats and so on and so forth. But it is generally true that we see more people arriving illegally especially when they come by water during the summer months. When the waters are calmer, when there are fewer storms, when on the whole it's safe. I think the point to make here is we've already had 110,000 people arriving, mostly by sea, when it is still winter. We can expect that number to increase quite significantly once winter fades away, once the storms go, once the sea is calm, once it becomes easier to get in a rickety boat and move across that short distance from North Africa or from Turkey and Greece into the European Union. So again, there are, I think, strong reasons to expect this number to increase even further as we enter spring and summer. The numbers are increasing, and I think that's the clear headline. Fourth bullet point. We are all focused on Syria, and of course we should be. What is unravelling and unfolding in Syria is a, a generational challenge, and I think, as I say, not only the European Union, but the globe has a responsibility and really hasn't found any answers. Let us not forget Syria. This really is a, a once-in-a-generation catastrophe, the, de the death of a country and the displacement of a country. I think we should never forget that. But we shouldn't just focus on Syria. It is true that the majority of people arriving at the moment on our shores, in our countries, are from Syria, and they've rightly grabbed the headlines, but there are other people too. We have significant numbers also, people from Afghanistan, Iraq, Eritrea, Kosovo, and Albania as well. And please note Afghanistan. People have been fleeing Afghanistan since at least 1979. When I was your age, I did, an un and I won't tell you how long ago it was, but it was a long time ago, I did an undergraduate dissertation on Afghan refugees in Pakistan, and I went back to Pakistan quite recently to the same camps where I worked, where we have people who, there are people, a lot of people, in refugee camps in Pakistan, of whose, both of whose parents were also born in that refugee camp. We are talking about generations of people in camps. So the Syrians have been coming for five years, the Afghans have been outside their country and fleeing and moving and, and trying to find solutions. 30, 40 years, but for a generation. That's a generational challenge. And as I say, also, Iraq, the lingering catastrophe in Iraq, Eritrea, a real warning spot at the moment in Eritrea. Burundi is about to blow up, we think, and closer to home, despair <coughs> that many young people feel in places like Kosovo and Albania as well. 
What that adds up to is mixed migration. And I know that you're all studying migration, and I know that you all understand mixed migration, but let me quickly remind you. Mixed migration in at least two ways. Firstly, a mixture of populations. As you can see, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Eritrea, Kosovo, and Albania. More importantly, a mixture of different people moving for different reasons. Now, I am a, I hope it's obvious to you, someone who works hard and thinks hard and is largely pro-refugee and pro-asylum and pro-migration, but I can confidently stand here and say this to you. Of this group of people arriving in Europe today, the majority of the Syrians are refugees. They will satisfy the 1951 Convention, they will get refugee status, they are clearly fleeing conflict and persecution. The majority of people from Albania will not. They are moving to work. Now, I don't think there's anything ignoble or wrong about moving to work. I admire you. If you've got the wherewithal to decide you want to move because you want to improve your career, or you want to realise your ambitions, or you want to feed your family, or you want your children to have a better life, I admire you for doing that, but you are not a refugee. The challenge we have today is that the boats arriving in places like Lampedusa are carrying, on the one hand, refugees, people who deserve and are, have an entitlement to international protection, and on the other hand, people who are coming to work and have a completely different set of rights. Disentangling those people, working out who is and isn't a refugee, is an immensely burdensome, difficult and expensive thing to do. Last year, the United Kingdom spent £5 billion pounds on its asylum system. And this was to process something like 80,000 asylum seekers. The money we're spending on 80,000 asylum seekers is taking money away from UNHCR, which is trying to protect 20 million refugees around the world at the moment. Mixed migration, asylum burdens are a real challenge in the European Union. I think if you want to talk about a crisis, that for me is much more of a crisis than the numbers alone. So mixed migration is a real challenge. And again, I mean, to make this, to bring this home to you, you know, you're, you're a young UNHCR officer. You, you've maybe five years older than you, you've done a master's degree, you've got your job at UNHCR, you're standing at the port in Lampedusa, a boat turns up in the middle of the night, on that boat are a hundred people, and your job is to tell me which of those people is a refugee, and which of those people can legitimately be deported because they're irregular migrants. It's basically impossible to do. It's a very hard thing to do. Mixed migration is a challenging, technical, uh, practical policy problem. A couple of other bullet points again on this overview, and of course there's much more to say, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end of this presentation. At least, and I think you should take these numbers with a pinch of salt, the numbers are certainly higher, we just don't count and find dead bodies as much as we should or could, but IOM reports at least 3,695 deaths in 2015, the vast majority of those people who drowned in the Mediterranean. Already, in whatever it is, 55 days, 366 people. That's already 10% of the people who died last year, dead in 2016. And I just want to take a step back, and I just want to... One of the challenges of, of talking about anything, whether it's refugees or poverty or, or starving children, we as human beings, when you start to see big numbers, you tend to lose sight of the individual. Big numbers tend to swarm our minds and kind of make us lose sympathy and compassion, and you just kind of turn off the big numbers. These are significant numbers of people. This is the European Union, this is Europe, this is the cradle of democracy. This is the wealthiest single market in the world. This is the continent that brought about the 1951 Convention on Refugees. This is a group of people, us, and the other 500 million people in this continent, who should and rightly have been proud of the way that we have fought and fought for human rights and, and dignity and democracy. And I am saying to you that 4,000 people have drowned in boats trying to get to Europe to claim asylum. You should be ashamed, because I'm ashamed, and I think we should all be ashamed. This is simply unacceptable. And it's continuing to happen, as I say, at least 366, probably by now 400 people drowned in 2016. The final bullet point, one in three, we estimate, of the people arriving today in the European Union are younger than 18. Now, some of them are 17 and 16, some of them are much younger than that, so-called unaccompanied minors, people coming without their parents who are below the age of consent and below 18 years old. And again, let me try to give some texture or some reality to what that means. I don't know if there are any parents in the room, I suspect there are a few, and even if you're not a parent, I think you can get what I'm trying to tell you. Some unaccompanied minors are clearly the outcome of a family strategy. Send a 16-year-old kid 
hopefully he'll get refugee status, he or she will get refugee status, and then the family can join them. It's, a, it's quite a good technique and a strategy for trying to move your family uh, into the European Union. Other unaccompanied minors, I believe, are a symbol of desperation. Can you imagine being a parent and putting a young child in the back of a truck or on a boat and saying to them, good luck, I may never see you again, you may drown, you may suffocate in the back of the truck, Inshallah, one day we'll be united. Best wishes to a 12-year-old. You know, I, I, I find that viscerally quite difficult to, to accept, and I think a lot of parents, and even would-be parents, which I suspect most of you uh, are, should and do. So, let's not underestimate the challenges. This is the European Union, there's a significant numbers of people, numbers are increasing, people are drowning. Our basic raison d'etre as Europeans, I think, is under threat because of the way that we are responding to this crisis at the moment. So, there is a, there is a challenge, how it may should we pay attention, attention to it? Well, if you believe that the numbers are a challenge, and I think the numbers are a challenge, let's look at what we might be able to do to reduce those numbers. And I think there are four options, and you won't be surprised to hear that I think the first option is not the right option. One option is to build walls as our friend Mr. Orban is doing at the moment in Hungary, and as we are seeing barbed wire fences being put up in Macedonia, and to all extents and purposes we're having virtual walls by visa regimes being imposed in places like uh, Sweden and the United Kingdom, certainly making sure that not many people get there, and so on and so forth. So either physical walls or virtual walls, the European Union is, is reinforcing its fortress to try to keep the hordes away. I think that's a kind of general impression of what's taking place at the moment. Will it work? I doubt it. There's no evidence at all from other parts of the world, from other times in history, that building walls keep people out. There are desperate people who want to come to the European Union and they will find a way to do it. If you build walls, they'll pay smugglers, they'll come illegally, they'll take more risks, they'll die doing it, but they will continue to come. So I don't believe that building walls is the way to reduce the numbers if we believe that reducing numbers is the way to go. And I believe that quite strongly. The one thing I would say about building walls, and I had a very interesting discussion with a few people, I don't think they're here, an earlier class in Maastricht today, one way that we might explain the big spike in the arrival of people early this year is that they know the walls are being built and they're trying to get in before the walls are built. That is one way to read this, that restrictions are coming, let's get there quickly before the restrictions really kick in. And that might be one way to explain it. I may be wrong. It may be that if we do build our walls and fences and start to increase patrols in the Mediterranean and turn back boats, it may be that we can stop people coming in even if that's the case, it's nothing I want to be associated with. Because what we are doing and what you see there is the securitization of migration. Rather than seeing this as a humanitarian challenge or any sense of fraternity or brotherhood or sisterhood or compassion or reaching out to, to assist people in need, leave alone the fact that most of our countries are basically directly responsible for what's happening in Syria, forget that piece for a moment, but these are human beings on the move because they're in desperate need of assistance. We have international commitments to protect them and assist them. I don't think we should be building walls to keep them out. So even if building walls work, which I doubt, it's not a policy that will get my vote. Let's leave it there and you can tell me what you think. I think there are other ways that we might think about trying to reduce the numbers in perhaps a more humane uh, and dignified way. One is to think, and I think we need to think innovatively, and it's certainly not easy, to think about what we might be able to do to protect people who are inside Syria. Now, something like one third of all Syrians are now displaced. Just, just let me say that again. One in three Syrians in the world have now left their homes. This is a country that is just unravelling before our eyes. Something like 6 million are internally displaced, so they've left their homes and they've stayed somewhere within Syria, often moving between different pockets of safety to try to find somewhere that they can subsist and survive. The rest of them are outside the country, the majority locally in the region, and of course an increasing number also moving on uh, towards Europe and the European Union. Is there something we can do, or think about doing, to try to make sure that people can stay in Syria in some form of dignity and safety? We've certainly done it before. It's controversial, and it certainly wasn't without its problems, but certainly during the first Iraq war, for example, we managed to define no-fly zones so that people in Iraq could stay in a certain part of Iraq, in this case northern Iraq, and they could be protected and provided with assistance. 
we could strengthen the guidelines and the provisions for protecting internally displaced persons. At the moment, they're pretty weak. We could try to find ways to identify, to access, to look after internally displaced persons to make sure that they're safe in their own countries. This has to be done sensitively. It's enormously difficult. But if we can find ways that people can stay in their own countries safely, that seems to me to be a more sensible way to try to deal with this as an upstream challenge than simply building walls against people once they've made the decision to move. The second thing I think we could think about is trying to create more opportunities in the countries where many of these refugees currently are. Most people arriving in the European Union are not getting on planes in Aleppo and flying directly to Berlin. Most of them have come to Turkey or Jordan and Lebanon and are now moving on again from those countries because they, they see no prospects in these countries. And Katie Kushmeider, who is here and I think is speaking to you in a couple of weeks, has done extensive interviews with mainly Syrians but also other populations in Turkey and Greece, and I'm sure she'll be sharing with you in a couple of weeks what she learned about people's motivations. People see often no future for them and their children in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, even in Greece, and they are looking for ways, even if it means paying smugglers, even if it means dividing their family, they're looking for ways to move on into Europe. Can we think of ways whereby people can stay safely and again in dignity and perhaps even provide opportunities for them in Turkey, in Jordan, and Lebanon? <coughs> Because I think I would argue, and this is a generalisation, but I think I'll argue a generalisation, on the whole, refugees want to stay close to their home and they want to go home when they can. I don't think refugees want to come to Europe and forget Syria. I think most Syrians you speak to today, even in Germany, would say, if Syria calms down, I'd really rather go home. Because I suspect in, Sy in Syria, most of these people lived a reasonably good life. Syria was a pretty civilised and democratic and decent place until about 10 years ago. And I suspect many people had a really quite good life there and they are now consigning themselves to what's going to be a very difficult life even when they make it to the European Union. I think there's a strong case, if we can find a way to do it, to provide protection for people within their region. So that they don't have to pay smugglers. So that they don't have to get on boats and risk their lives. So that they can continue to live locally. Now this is of course what the European Union is trying to do. The European Union is trying to effectively bribe Turkey by giving them 3 billion euros and saying, can you please anchor, and that's the word that they're using, anchor the refugees there, stop them coming here. I think that's cynical, and I don't think that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to find options whereby people can make a, a reasonable decision, and that decision can be, I would rather stay here, closer to Syria, with the prospect of going home to Syria at some point, and still find some sort of prospect in Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon. Again, difficult to achieve, but I think we should be at least thinking about it. The other thing that strikes me when we think about how to reduce the numbers, and again, if you think that's the priority, and again, I'm not sure that it necessarily is, I think we need to pay much more attention to smuggling in particular, and also to an extent trafficking, and again, Katie's done immense and great work on smuggling in particular in this context. Basically, every Syrian who arrives in Europe has paid a smuggler to be here. This is no longer you know, one in ten or an unusual group of people, to get to Europe you pay a smuggler because it's the easy and obvious and actually relatively cheap thing to do. Most people pay smugglers to get here. What do smugglers do? Smugglers don't just get you here by getting on a boat or getting you a pass, whatever else it is. They give you information. And what you need more than anything else is information. We know that the European Union is not acting in a harmonised way, that the UK has different policies in Sweden and Finland and Germany so on and so forth. The smuggler is paid to give you that information. If you have this profile and you're from this nationality and you want to try to achieve this, try Sweden, because at the moment they've got an open door policy. Ah, Sweden's just closed its borders. Maybe try Germany, because it's quite soft at the moment. And if you go to Germany, go through this border entry. The smugglers have the information that you need. I think we need to be much more creative in the way that we deal with smuggling, because I think the policy approach to smuggling is very blunt. I think we think of smugglers as evil criminals who are doing harm and we need to stop them at all costs, imprison them, persecute them, prosecute them, whatever words may be. I think we need a much more thoughtful and sophisticated response to smuggling. And let me just give you a quick example from a different context, from Afghanistan, but again, many people arriving in the European Union are from Afghanistan. I've done a lot of work on smuggling from Afghanistan over the last decade or so, and this is how smuggling has evolved in the Afghan context. About 10 years ago, if you wanted to be smuggled from Afghanistan to the UK, you would pay all of the money up front, let's say $8,000, all of the money up front to the smuggler. Now, of course, the risk you run is the smuggler disappears with the money and you're stuck in Afghanistan minus $8,000. 
Smugglers recognised that this was not a viable business model. People were not going to come to them if that was what was on offer. So what smugglers then did was say, right, give me half the money up front. You give me $4,000 now, I'll get you to the UK, and then you pay the balance of $4,000. Seems reasonable. The problem is that when you get to the UK, you're dead in my hands. I can exploit you. You still owe me $4,000. I have decided it's now $6,000, and I want it by next week. Now, if you decide to be a prostitute, we can probably make the money pretty quickly. Over to you. So this is how smuggling becomes trafficking, how a seemingly voluntary deal becomes a pretty enforced piece of exploitation fairly quickly. This is how smuggling works in Afghanistan today. Today, the money is deposited with a third party. Your family gives the money to a third party, <coughs> normally a, a money lender or one of the money dealers in one of the markets in Afghanistan or northern Pakistan. The money is only released by the third party to the smuggler once you have arrived safely in the United Kingdom. Now, if you think about what I'm saying, what I'm talking about is a money back guarantee on smuggling. If you don't make it, I get no money. So don't be surprised that smuggling works. Smuggling works because I can't afford for it not to work. Don't be surprised that smugglers are moving larger and larger numbers of people at the same time, because if 10 of them drown, at least I'll get the money from the other 80 who haven't drowned. That's how we have to start thinking about smuggling. Don't think of these people simply as ignorant, evil criminals. They are businessmen. They are making men, almost always men. They have a business mind. They have information. They know what they're doing. I think we just need to be much more sophisticated about the way we deal with it. And by the way, as an aside, I would argue that not all smugglers are evil. I would argue that in some cases, smugglers are providing a service and moving people out of harm's way. I think I would argue that Oscar Schindler was a smuggler. I think most of us would agree that Oscar Schindler was probably something of a hero and not an evil criminal. Oscar Schindler made money by moving people out of the reach of the Nazis and giving them jobs, exploiting them jobs in his factories. That's basically smuggling. And I think we could argue that Schindler was doing a good thing about that. So a more sophisticated analysis and response to smuggling, I think, is needed. So there's some ideas. If the, the numbers are a problem, if you've got a problem with the numbers, let's try to find creative, innovative ways to, to reduce the numbers in a meaningful, respectful, dignified way. And I think there are some precedents that have been set in terms of how we can do it. And I think we can think quite creatively about how we might try to do it. But I don't think the numbers are the problem. And I don't think the numbers are the crisis. As I said at the beginning, I think the real crisis is a lack of political leadership with the, with the exceptional exception of Angela Merkel, and I wrote a blog the other day nominating her to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, I don't think she will be. I hope that she steps down as Chancellor and becomes the next Secretary General of the United Nations. We need someone with her balls, excuse my language. We need someone with some vision. We need someone who's willing to, to do what she did, which is lead. Because I don't see leadership anywhere else in Europe at all. There's a crisis of leadership. There's a crisis of confidence. The European Union is fraying at the edges. The confidence in the European project is going. And, and let, let, me just, <laughs> let me just repeat that. Because of three million people, the great European project that has been built and reinforced over 50 years, that includes a single market, that includes the single greatest and most wealthy single market in the world, is fraying at the edges because of a few million people who are in need of help. I mean, it's astonishing when you stop and think about it. A huge political project, fraying at the edges, Schengen being closed down, borders being reinforced because of a couple of million people. I mean, I don't, I, you should be depressed about where Europe's going. I think there's a crisis of confidence. I think most Europeans no longer believe their government is in any way in control of this. I think if I, and I won't do it, if I did a straw poll and said to you, how many of you think, think your country or your government's in control of the migration? I suspect most of you wouldn't put your hand up. We think, and we're probably right to think, the government has lost control completely. There's a crisis of confidence. There's a crisis of the European project. I think there's a crisis of political leadership. There's a bigger set of crises that we need to deal with than just the so-called refugee crisis, which is not us. So let me kind of begin to conclude by talking about resolving what I think is the real crisis. And I'll give you a slide on each of these. Part of the real crisis is a lack of perspective. I keep saying to you, a mere two, three million. Millions are lots of people. And again, behind the millions there are individuals who are suffering and putting their children on boats and drowning and so on and so forth. But I still maintain that if you adopt some perspective, a million, two million, three million people shouldn't be the big deal that we and our societies are beginning to think that it is. Let's adopt some perspective. Secondly, I would really criticise 
Europeans and European governments and the European Union for being reactive and not proactive. I could have told you three years ago that large numbers of Syrians would come to Europe. And if I had told you that for sure, our policymakers and politicians should have known that, of course it was going to happen. <coughs> Syria was on the verge of collapsing. It's only a country or two away from here. We know how smuggling networks work. They were not going to go to Australia. They weren't going to stay in Syria. They were never going to last long in Turkey. Where else were they going to go? Obviously, Greece, Germany. I mean, it wasn't, it, this, this, isn't, this isn't rocket science. And yet we reacted as if it was the most incredible and amazing thing that ever happened. We all knew it, it was obvious we could have planned for it, but we react, we react, we react. People are drowning in the Mediterranean. Oh my God, we better send boats out. Well, you could have done something perhaps before people started drowning and young boys were washed up on the shores. Large numbers of people arriving in Southeast Europe, well, we better do something about it. You knew they were coming, why didn't you do something about it? I think we need to be much more proactive, and I've got a few ideas about how we can be more proactive in, in preparing and responding to this. Negative, not positive. I strongly believe, and I suspect Mrs. Merkel believes this, and certainly business leaders believe this, and I'll speak about the private sector in a moment, this so-called crisis can be turned into an opportunity. We have an ageing, fading continent. We have large labour market gaps. We have a demographic deficit. And what we are seeing is the arrival of young, willing, resourceful people. Turn that into an opportunity. They don't have to be a burden. They don't have to be a crisis. They don't have to be some sort of catastrophe. They can be tomorrow's workers. They can be tomorrow's parents. They can be tomorrow's taxpayers. It can easily be done. We just need to move the needle from negative to positive. And the final point I'll make, and again a slide on each of these, we've really got to move beyond being individual, being insular, being nationalistic about this. We've got to find a way to share this out amongst European Union countries, and I think more importantly, we've got to find a way to convince the rest of the world that it's in their interest too to be part of the solution. Because it's not acceptable that the United States and Canada, and they're resettling a few people, but largely are standing by and watching Europe decay and, and kind of keeping their hands clean. I think what's going on in Europe poses an almost existential threat that the rest of the world should also be very concerned about indeed. So let's try to think about how we might partner with other countries as well as with the other actors within our own society. So let me run through these quickly. Lack of perspective. Yes, a million people arrived last year. Yes, I reckon two million, if not more, might arrive this year. Never forget, 85% of the world's 20 million refugees are in the poorer parts of the world. This is not a European, northern, rich crisis. The crisis of refugees is in the south. The crisis of refugees is in Pakistan, and Turkey, and Iran, and Central Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and Thailand, and so on and so forth. This is where the challenge is. This is where we have camps of millions of people. This is where we have protracted refugee situations, where people have been sitting in camps for 20 or 30 years. This is where we have poor countries dealing with vast numbers of refugees. I did my PhD in Malawi many, many years ago. Again, you can tell how old, well, you can't tell how old I am, but it was a long time ago. When I was in Malawi, which at the time was the fourth <coughs> poorest country in the world, one in three people in the country was a refugee. So, you know, don't start panicking about 20,000 asylum seekers in the UK. One in three people in the fourth poorest country in the world is a refugee, a Malawi coat just fine, thank you very much. Open refugee camps, dealt with the situation, people went home after five or ten years, it is possible to do this. So let's get some perspective on that. The, the, if there's a refugee crisis, it's not in Europe. It's in Africa, uh, Pakistan, again Iran, Turkey, and so on and so forth. You can even do that with Syrians. Even if there's a Syrian refugee crisis, it's not in Europe. The Syrian refugee crisis is an internally displaced crisis, six million people internally displaced in Syria, and it's a crisis of the region, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, 2.7 million people now in Turkey, up to a million in Lebanon, 500,000 in Jordan. Poor countries dealing with a much more significant, at least by proportion, number of people than the EU28. The global refugee crisis is not in Europe. The Syrian refugee crisis is not in Europe either. If you want to put refugees into an even bigger context, think about migrants. 20 million refugees around the world, 240 million migrants. Two or three million refugees in Europe, 50 million migrants. Migration is a much bigger thing than just refugees. And the reason I really put this up is I was in, 
I was with the World Economic Forum recently in Davos a few weeks ago, where all of the talk on migration was Syrian refugees. You would, you would think there was nothing in the world apart from Syrian refugees. There's much more in the world than Syrian refugees. There are migrant workers being exploited as they try to build the World Cup stadium in Qatar. There are uh, migrant women being exploited around the world at the moment. There are m far more than three million refugees who are facing very serious circumstances around the world, whether they're irregular, exploited, and so on and so forth. So there are bigger migration challenges even than the Syrian so-called refugee crisis here in Europe. Again, get some perspective. 500 million people in the European Union. And you're telling me that we can't deal with a million people. Last year rang alarm bells because of a million people. Now, this is a, I think this is a bit of a silly analogy, but it was an analogy that was given to me the other day by a Swede. It's a bit like living on a, a really wealthy island with 500 people and panicking because one person arrives by boat. It doesn't quite work for me, because a million people is more than one person, but you get the point. We are 500 million people, and there's a million people arriving, and somehow this becomes crisis. It, it's not a crisis, the numbers are not a crisis. Get a life, get a perspective. We are the wealthiest, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we, are, we are the wealthiest single market in the world. We are fabulously wealthy, thanks largely to the hard work of Mrs. Merkel in Germany, and I think we should pay credit to Germany to some extent. But again, we have the money, we have the resources. Yes, there's a lingering recession. Yes, there's high unemployment in places like Spain. But again, we have the, the capacity, the resources to easily absorb a relatively small number of people, and even if we didn't, we still should. We have an international <coughs> commitment to do so. We are all signatories of the 1951 Convention, which was designed to provide protection and assistance to people who can turn nowhere else for that. Do you really want to live in a continent where we stop doing that? You're desperate, you have no hope, your government has abandoned you, it is my job to protect and assist you, I'm not going to do it anymore. This is, this is not just an international law, this is a basic moral compass issue for me, and I think we're up, the needle is, is getting lost somewhere on the moral compass. The final point I'd make about perspective is we've been here before, ladies and gentlemen, and we did it just fine. In the mid-1990s, over a million people fled from the former Yugoslavia across 15 EU member states, and on the whole, their, their reception, and it was a long time, and there were lots of variations around uh, <coughs> European countries, but on the whole, it worked. Some went back when the Balkans settled down, many stayed and settled, and we look around our societies today and we see very successful immigrants from the Balkans. So we've been here before, we've managed before, we should be able to manage again. We have an historical precedent for doing this. Can you wait until the end? Thanks. So perspective, I think, is important. That's the first P. Proactive. As I said, I think we've been too reactive and we have found that we have been surprised by something that didn't need to surprise us. I think we need to be more proactive in at least two ways. One is we need to look upstream, by which I mean look at where the refugees are coming from, look at Syria. I think much more concerted efforts are needed to do something about what is going on in Syria. And I don't mean protecting people in Syria or creating more opportunities for people in Turkey. I mean getting to the fundamental cause of why people are leaving Syria. It seems to me unacceptable that the UN is in deadlock over the Security Council uh, veto process, which means that we can do nothing about it. That NATO and Russian planes are bombing Aleppo day in, day out, and killing people accidentally, and bombing MSN for hospitals, and so on and so forth. It seems to me that we need to pay much more attention to the upstream challenges of the name at the moment, and I don't think we're doing enough to do that seriously. Mr. Kerry is you know, shuffling to and forth and doing his best, but I don't think he's having much success at the moment. I don't think we can just stand by and say it's intractable. It's not intractable. We need to find innovative solutions and do something about it. More important for me are the downstream challenges. Um, my feeling is that the majority of Syrians who have arrived in Europe now will never go home. I don't think we should expect them to go home. I fear that Syria is going to be a long, drawn-out conflict that I suspect will end with Mr. Hassan continuing to be in power, by the way, but we'll see what happens there. Most of the people who come here from Syria will get refugee status. Refugee status in Europe is effectively a permanent status. You can eventually become a citizen. I think it's unlikely that many of these million at the moment, and perhaps more coming in, will go home. This is a population that I think largely is here to stay. The downstream challenge is integration. Because what I don't want is to come here in 10 years' time and give another lecture and say we didn't integrate the Syrians. They're now living in Molenbeek 
There's lots of them who are unemployed, they're disenfranchised, uh, some of them have become radicalised. What happened? What went wrong? They've become foreign fighters, they're going, and so on and so forth. I think if you ask me what the crisis is, what the potential crisis is, that's the potential crisis. That we have a million people who can do good, who can be an opportunity, who can make a difference, but if we don't get it right, if we don't do integration sensitively, if we don't do education, if we don't do training, if we don't find ways to incorporate them, if we don't overcome the shocking Islamophobia and xenophobia that we find amongst many of our populations, this is not just going to be a lost generation in terms of economic opportunities, this is going to be not a, a, a lost opportunity that may have some very serious and quite dangerous consequences. We don't want an underclass of radicalised, disenfranchised, marginalised people. And I think there's a risk there that we have to be very aware of. So let's be more proactive upstream, but let's also be more proactive downstream. I think both challenges are there, and I think we have the wherewithal to begin to think about how to do it. Positive. I genuinely believe that we just need to start changing the language. And I put crisis in inverted commas, and perhaps I shouldn't use the word crisis at all. Of course there's a humanitarian challenge. Of course these are large numbers of people. Yes, people are drowning. Yes, even people who make it to the European shores are facing difficulties. Malmo, southern Sweden, by the end of last year, 10,000 people a week were arriving in Malmo. Malmo was very hospitable until very recently. The Swedes have changed their policy. But Malmo ran out of beds. Every army barracks, every dormitory, every spare room, every school hall had gone, and people were sleeping on the streets in the cold in Malmo. Uh, you know, of course there are challenges, and I'm not pretending to you there are not challenges. And by the way, the challenges are particularly felt at the local level. It's one thing saying Germany has to absorb a million people. It's another thing saying a small town in Germany has to absorb 20,000 people. That's a completely different story. So it's the local level I think that really matters when you speak about challenges. We need to make sure that we address what's going on at the local level. But I really think that if we change the language from crisis and catastrophe and disaster to opportunity, then there is an opportunity. And again, in Davos a few weeks ago, that's the language business leaders were using. We had government saying crisis, crisis, crisis. We had business leaders saying opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. I think if we speak more positively about this, there is an opportunity out there. Two examples. One is we have a demographic deficit. We all know this. It varies across countries and even within countries in the European Union. But as a whole, the European population is ageing. It's greying, it's living longer, we have fewer people paying taxes to support a large number of old people. And of course, you know that your main draw on the health system is in the last three or four years of your life. It's clear that there's a, a pensions crisis looming in many of our countries. Migration isn't the only answer. Migration is not the silver bullet. By the way, for two reasons. One is that migrants get old, surprise, surprise, and so they may come when they're young, but then they get to 17, you have to look after them as well. The other point, of course, is that migrants don't import their fertility rates. A woman may have eight children when she lives in Somalia, but when she gets to Berlin, she'll have 1.7 children like German women do, because she'll find an education, because she'll find a job, because her kids aren't dying when, they, then when she gives birth to them, because she has a pension system, which means she doesn't rely on the kids in the old age, and so on and so forth. So migration is one part of a much bigger answer, and we're not here to discuss that. But there's no doubt at all that the injection of a youthful group of people, which is what this largely is, a million people at least, can inject something into our demography and be a long-term gain. More importantly, this is a potential labour market filler. There are labour market gaps across our economies. Despite unemployment, there are big labour market gaps. Every business leader you speak to says there are labour market gaps. These are young, resourceful <coughs> people who want to work. Let's put them to work. And I think this is what Mrs Merkel sees. I think she sees if she survives, and I think she's in trouble, but I think she sees this population as reinforcing Germany's preeminence. I think she sees the injection of young people who, if integrated right, and it's a very big if, but if integrated correctly, if given training, if given apprenticeships, if given an education, if given the chance to make it, will make it and will continue Germany's economic strength. And I think places like the United Kingdom, that has announced 20,000 resettlement places over six years, is really missing a trick here. And I think there's an opportunity to be had and we're missing it. So let's try to be a bit more positive. Of course there are challenges, of course people are drowning, of course the numbers are big, of course local entities in particular are finding this a real challenge, but there's also an opportunity if we want to think of it in those terms. My final point, 
we need to think about partnership. And I've only used partnership because it's another P and I'm trying to do this around P's. The first partnership, and I've got one more after this, the first partnership point is that proximity doesn't equal responsibility. It's not just on Europeans. It shouldn't just be on Europeans. I think we should be making sure that we find ways to engage a wider set of actors, including other richer countries. You know, and I think even within the European Union, we've really failed to, to show any form of solidarity. I'm sure that when Mrs. Merkel stood up and said, I'm going to resettle a million refugees, she expected other European leaders to follow her lead, and they didn't. Our leaders have let her down. You know, there was just a retreat from this. Great, Germany's doing it, we don't have to do it. That was not what this was supposed to be about, but that's what it's become. So we've got to make sure that the responsibility and the shared responsibility is understood. And you can do this in any way you want. You can say that the US and the UK were in some way responsible for the conflict in Syria and Iraq and have some culpability. I don't think that argument stands up anymore, but that's one way you can argue it. You can argue that... I don't think the United States wants to see Europe fall apart because Europe is a wealthy market which imports and exports and has great trade relations. It's an American national interest to make sure this survives. You could argue that if the 1951 convention and the international refugee regime falls apart and it's in danger of falling apart because of what's going on in Europe, then everyone suffers. There are all sorts of ways you can find arguments to make this, but I think we need to generate a much bigger and wider set of responsibilities than just putting it all on Europe, and especially just putting it on Germany in this case. I think we need to engage civil society much more meaningfully. I think there's a lot of good ideas, a lot of compassion, a lot of really hard work taking place within civil society in Europe, and I think we need to, to tap that resource much more strongly than we have at the moment. And by we, I mean governments in the European Union, and you'll understand that I don't represent either government or the European Union. My final point on this is the private sector, and I gave a very short seminar on this earlier today. What I've seen from the private sector is a real engagement in this challenge. Again, a headline message that this is an opportunity, not just a challenge. Real efforts to provide apprenticeships and training and jobs. Real efforts to try to integrate some of the incoming people into the labour force. I think the private sector sees this as a dream come true. This is a, a young pool of potentially talented people that we can mine right now and take advantage of. And I'm seeing really positive messaging out of the private sector that I have to say I haven't seen over the last five or ten years around migration in any other context. So let's at least bring the private sector into the discussion. And I'm not being I'm not wearing rose-tinted glasses. Some of the private sector is pretty evil, and I'm not suggesting they're all champions and, and knights in white armour, but some of them certainly got some good ideas, and some of the more credible organisations I think we should be thinking about work. Final P, prospects. I've said all of this, and let me just summarise. There are challenges. I think we can think more creatively about reducing numbers if you want to, but more importantly, I think we need to define the crisis in a more meaningful way and then think about how to deal with the real crisis. And I've given you four P's around that. What do I think of the prospects? Well, let me summarise my pessimism, if you want a sixth P, my pessimism in this way. About six months ago, I wrote a blog for the World Economic Forum. And I said I thought there was a chance that Europe was at a tipping point. And this is a very overused concept, but I said there's a chance that Europe was at a tipping point. And I said that for three reasons. I said, firstly, unlike any other time I've known in Europe, asylum seekers and refugees are voting with their feet. They are moving. You can build your walls. You can bribe Turkey with $3 billion. You can try to carve out no-fly zones in Syria. We are coming. You can put up walls. You can put up your barbed wire fences. We'll cut them down and we'll move. I've never seen such determination amongst the people that I'm seeing at the moment in the European context. 3,000 people dying on boats just to get here. So one tipping point that the notion that we can keep them out or control the flow seemed to me to be, to be going. Second point I made, discussing the potential tipping point, was political leadership. This was shortly after Mrs. Merkel made her statement, and I kind of made the point that, you know, over the last decades, Europe has resettled very few people. The US does it, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I saw this as a very bold move very risky move, and I think there's lots of criticisms that we can just discuss, but a very bold move to stand up and say, there is a crisis, this is an issue of compassion, we are going to stand up and try to resettle a million Syrians. And again, we hope that other countries would, would follow suit. So I made the point that we may be seeing a tipping point in terms of Europe really turning the corner and taking more responsibility over dealing with these issues in a responsible way. The third point I made was that, unlike any time I can remember in Europe, European citizens 
on the whole, were reacting positively. Of course, you know, you had have have the right wing marches, you had continuing racism and Islamophobia and xenophobia, but you had lots of citizens responding positively, providing food, providing blankets, going across borders and giving people lifts across borders. You know the stories that were coming out of Germany and East Europe and so on and so forth. I think quite heartwarming examples of people trying to make a difference. And by the way, what it seems to me those people were saying, they were saying to their governments, please stop using us as an excuse. Because for many years, what our governments have said is that we can't do anything more generous on migration, we can't do anything remotely near open borders, we can't be in any way more hospitable because the people will vote us out. And I think what the people are saying is, you may have other reasons to do it, but it's not us. We are not going to vote you out if you do that. Please stop blaming us. And I really saw that, that message coming out. So, potential tipping point. Uh, people voting with their feet, political leadership, and a, a compassion around citizens. Six months on, and this is where my pessimism comes in, has that tipping point taken place? Absolutely not. Which of my three points still exists? People are voting with their feet. We saw yesterday, I think, the Afghans carving a hole out of a barbed wire fence in Macedonia and storming in, and people will continue to come again. 110,000 people already in the last 55 days, whatever it is. So number one still stands. Political leadership, no, no, no. Merkel's under threat. No other political leaders have gone anywhere near doing what she did, so unfortunately her lead wasn't followed. And compassion, I fear, is fading. We have the fake, please note, fake, Syrian passport by one of the perpetrators of the attacks in the Bataclan in Paris. So now everyone's saying that Syrians are potential terrorists. We have some bizarre association between the terrible attacks on New Year's Eve in Cologne and the Syrians and the refugees. I think we have a general atmosphere that this is becoming a threat and a challenge and we want to do something to stop it. And I think that's really regrettable because I think that's a misreading of the situation. So let me, if I could, wrap up. Europe is facing a challenge. It's not a challenge of numbers, and if it is, I think we can do something more about it. I think it's a much more deep-rooted crisis of confidence, of political leadership, of, of maintaining our compassion, and I think those things are beginning to fray. And I think when we think about dealing with the crisis, it's those sorts of issues that we should be trying to deal with. Thank you.